Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's no problem here. And uh, welcome to our PIP webinar on transport and infrastructure. Uh, we'll, we've got a number of guest speakers and presenters who are going to be presenting their projects and uh, some of their products uh, to us over the next couple of hours uh, on the theme of transport and infrastructure. Uh, transport is uh, something we haven't really thought about in a while, really, given the current uh, pandemic conditions. We haven't been doing a lot of it. But given our collective will to get back out in the world and rethinking uh, how we do that in the light of climate change, uh, I feel it's a subject of real importance to architects. And of course, for every London Bridge station, I suppose we get, or HS2, there's probably a gamut of projects that come in under the radar, uh, but which literally keep the whole of the wheels of transport and industry running. Uh, I'd like to think of, you know, in a sense, more low-key projects like Utilitarian Reading Station by Grimshaw, or Manchester's Ordsall called by BDP, which was nominated for a number of engineering awards itself. Um, it's a well-attested fact that cities that move better work better and are more economically successful. And so cracking this particular aspect um, is of real relevance to ours and future generations. Um, I spent a bit of time out in Tokyo and I, I always was always kind of impressed in an odd way about how it did things like sacrifice its own Edogawa River in places to facilitate the running of an expressway, expressway directly over it. And it kind of made me think about <clears throat> how far we're prepared to go, really, to develop our infrastructure in the way that it almost becomes a kind of an ethical issue, really, about the populace who are left living with it. Um, you just need to look at how the carving up of railways north of the Euston Road, for instance, effectively ghettoised whole communities, uh, you know, in the Camden area, and created historical problems, which we're still kind of working out now. Um, Obviously, the latest iteration of transport developments of London, a particular relevance uh, to those who might use the Northern Line, is that it now extends down to Nine Elms and Battersea, which all looks good on a tube map, for instance, and it's you know effectively tax funded. But it seems like that's all going to a super prime development, which raises, raises issues about the motivations of connectivity. And I suppose really motivations and hopefully inspiring ones is what today's webinar is all about. Uh, so we've got some great examples, which I'm about to present to you. Uh, and I'm very glad that you're all here to participate in listening to them. Uh, we'll move forward to uh, Andrew Smith, Managing Director of Ball Parking Systems. Uh, donkeys years ago, when I was working for an office out in Japan, as I mentioned before, uh, automatic car storage and retrieval systems were a novelty that helped put into context the enormous speculative value of property in Tokyo. Given how normalised the systems have become here in the UK, it kind of made me aware of how much that sense of speculation has become part and parcel of London's real estate market here. But it doesn't really take away from the ingeniousness of the solution, which always leaves me looking at it with a bit of childlike Heath Robinson wonder. Uh, there's also benefits of disappearing vehicles below ground in order to free up the space at ground level and to more productive public use. Looking at the latest developments in the technology uh, is Andrew Smith, who established the UK subsidiary of Vought in 1995, and who is now Managing Director of the company. He's going to be giving us a brief update on the downs and ups in the world of parking systems. Uh, Andrew, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I can... Uh... Take it away. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to take you, it's going to be a, a quite a brief almost crash course, um, to use a phrase, uh, into mechanical parking systems and what they do, why we use them. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, then, is just, again, I'll share my screen and we will start. Let's see if this works. Uh, okay, I need to just make that a little bit better. Okay, can we see that? Thank goodness for that. Right, okay. Um, what I wanted to do is, um, I don't know why, but I'm just in the... Hold on. I'll go back to the my first slide. Right, okay, there we are. Um, we, we, I'm Andrew Smith, Managing Director of World Parking Systems. As I've just been said, we brought or started to bring 
mechanical working systems here into the UK. And uh, the first one was installed probably in about 1978 in Whetstone, North London. Um, but I, I came from a, a background of high bay warehouses and storage system systems. So when I sort of discovered mechanical parking systems, it utterly fascinated me um, the things that could be done. Um, and it always seemed to me as well that there was such a waste of space generally in urban design and buildings. I, I do drive past buildings sometimes and just wonder why we're doing it in such an old-fashioned way with lots of these rectangular boxes just stored all on the ground, taking up valuable urban space. Um, so what I'm going to do is just briefly, and it is going to be brief, um, just to go through what I'm going to say to you today and where we're going with this to help you understand a little bit better. So first thing I, I thought I'd just give is a little bit of background um, into the history of parking systems worldwide and in the UK, um, you know, what benefits they can provide, some are obvious, some not quite so, um, and really how to decide how to use them, what is the best uh, system for your uh, particular project. So if I move on to some very ancient photographs, there's a couple of photographs on very old parking systems. People seem to think, to some extent, it's a very modern um, iteration and idea, but uh, we believe the first one was installed in New York in about uh, 1905. And then as car numbers increased around the world, particularly in major urban centres, um, Paternoster types of systems, that's from 1932, that's Chicago. I couldn't find location of the one, but that's uh, certainly in the 40s, uh, almost the early 50s. But they're all ways of just compacting this area that we need to park cars. Um, and obviously now we've got a lot more of them than we ever did. So were, um, although the company's been going since 1903, turn their production over entirely to mechanical parking systems um, in 1972. But before that, um, they developed a very simple stacking system. So there, I'm just going to take you through a few photographs showing you the changes that have happened between you know, the 1960s and now. So I, I thought they were just two interesting photographs to show you there's the actual first installation from World Parking Systems in Munich in 1962. Very harsh mechanical looking device and it's modern equivalent now. Just a simple double stacking system with independent access for all the cars. But you can see there that we, we try to make them cleaner, clearer, easier to look after, nicer to use. I mean, you know, we, we do lots of... Um, uh, days where we invite people to the factory, where we get people that haven't used parking systems just to use them to get their reaction. What do they think about them? How easy were they to use, for instance? Um, and then since that time, we've gone beyond just hydraulic stacking systems um, at request. I mean, I sit with architects and talk to them uh, all of my, most of my working life, and we all go through the problems of how to get this storage problem sorted out. And we get requests that we feed back to the factory. The boffins over at the factory near Stuttgart work hard to try and find solutions to individual projects. And out of that, sometimes comes a complete new range of systems. So there's another picture of, of the system that, that were developed in the late 70s, early 80s. But even since then, they've come an awful long way. Um, that's a combulive system, so it's um, uh, semi-automated. You park on the platform yourself, but the system moves cars up and down and in the parking entrance level moves them sideways. So we can get up to five levels of parking all entered from one parking level. Um, and then new innovations, RFID control and, and things like that. All the way through to some of the systems that people are aware of because they make good pictures, they're very dramatic, um, fully automated systems. So they, they can be above ground, below ground. We do 10 different systems of all sorts of different shapes. Um, the, the, the thing I always say when we're starting to talk to architects or developers, though, is we, we get a lot of schemes through where they show a very dense automated system. But what you've got to always understand is that we've got to get people in and out. And people going in and out of garages 
actually take longer than the system typically to deliver their car. So then we've got a, a whole raft of examination to do what kind of street is it, what kind of user is it, how will they get in, how fast can they get in, how fast can they get out. So there's, there's quite a lot of work in the planning side and as a real tight integration between what we do and what the developer and the architect needs to achieve. Um, and then sometimes we get sort of very unusual requests. This was a request in Singapore, the Hamiltons. Uh, the developer there decided that for whatever reason, I still, I'm scratching my head slightly, um, that he wanted to have cars delivered into the apartments. So we designed, a, it was a, a slight special of a standard system. And we actually lift the cars up the side of the building automatically and slot them into the apartment block. Very, very uh, well-known system. So in the UK, though, what have we done? Uh, as I said, I, I first of all got to know about these and, and was just thrilled with what they could do. Love mechanical engineering, love solutions. Um, and so, yeah, the first one in the UK was in 1978. Uh, we've got around about 8,500 spaces now, so we haven't done too badly getting the message over that there are good ways of getting rid of that parking problem. Um, but the, 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 the thing I always stress to everybody we work with is, can we talk to you early? Don't worry about bothering us. We'll help you. We'll chew through all of the options. We know that many, many systems that, as an idea, will not come to fruition. But we're interested in education, so you know what can be done. And, you know, we're keen to actually help you do that and offer the full design, supply, installation, network of, of uh, maintenance engineers. And we, we do consider ourselves as certainly a world leader, if not one of the top three in the world, because we, we just develop and innovate so often and all the time. We have new systems appearing every two, three years, or derivatives of, of existing ones. Um, and our claim to fame is the widest range of mechanical parking systems in the world. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, because it's quite complicated sometimes. There's a lot of systems out there. Um, so, yeah, benefits of parking systems. What do they do? Why would you use one? I mean, the fundamental is fairly basic, and, and you can understand that. We want to use space better. It's a resource that we are... There's a lot of pressure on space. As populations increase, um, as car populations increase, we've got now around about 38, 39 million vehicles just here in the UK. That's an awful lot of volume, particularly in urban areas, that is potentially a destroyer of, of urban space. So this is part of a solution that, that we believe as is going to become more and more used um, as populations and, and, and personal transportation devices, however they're powered, are, are, are developed. Um, a lot of planning departments certainly don't want to see more street parking. They want developments to be self-contained. So this helps that happen. Um, it also, a, a one that people maybe don't think of sometimes, um, we can get cars into areas of a building which would normally be feasibly unfeasible. Um, yes, you probably could with lifts and ramps and turntables and things, but we can integrate that, say, into, a, into a, an automated system, which would do that all automatically. So the resident and the person, the driver, doesn't even know anything about it, but we can slot the cars out of the way. Um, the other side of it is that we create space for other uses. So we, we, we developed a lot of buildings with architects. So we, we create public spaces and green spaces around the building because we've compacted the parking space into such a small area. And then more recently, we, we've also been looking at how we make our big steel concrete systems, usually steel from our side, but um, make them more attractive. So we, we've done a lot of exhibitions, particularly around Europe, where we do tower systems and we cover them with green walls and different claddings and integrate them into buildings so they're almost not noticeable. So there are a lot of things that you can do with that block of, of parking um, systems. So what I thought I'd, I'd try to do, and, and it's a very big subject, but 
just to try and give everybody a bit of an understanding of what the individual parking systems are. Because if you look at our website, there's, there's hundreds of different derivatives and we, we feel calls all the time going, well, why would I choose this one and not that one? I can't go into that much detail today. I haven't got the time. But what, I, what we generally do as an explanation is try and say to people, look, parking systems are really in three groups. Stackers, they're hydraulic systems, very simple, up to three levels. We call them park lifts. No computer control. They are just a cassette of cars that go up and down. Then in the middle group, we describe systems as semi-automated. We call them combi lifts. They have a measure of automation in that the entrance level of the system moves sideways, and that allows it to create a gap to move spaces from above or below into the access level. So it just makes them a lot more spatially efficient than a park lift, but they are more expensive. So there's always a balance to be had. And then ultimately fully automatic, which are a person will drive into a garage, they will swipe an RFID card, a fingerprint, iris recognition, any interface that you want to put on it. Um, and the system then checks the garage and then will lower, raise, rotate, slide, whatever is necessary to get that car pallet into the racking system. So that uh, they're the systems that often allow us to park in areas that would normally be inaccessible. So these are, I thought it'd be good for you just to see the three systems. The, the first system, top right, is a park lift system as it's labelled. A simple, that's a two level cassette of cars. So it just gives you two levels of parking of one access aisle. Combi lift, that again is a two level version. As I say, we can go up to five levels, but it just gives you independent access of cars, but on two levels, but without the extra head of, a headroom that you would need with a stacker, for example. And then automatic systems, the picture there, I, I thought, Rather than show you a bunch of steel work in, in, a, in a big silo, um, I'll show you some entrances. And you, you can do some really lovely things with automatic system entrances, because all we're bothered about is creating a nice experience for, for users. So they can be really airy, light, lit. They can be above ground. We've got systems in Munich where we put systems underneath a street, and we've just got glass boxes, for example, creating uh, better areas for play areas for children and things. So we're always looking at the future, uh, always innovating. Um, and more recently, we've introduced uh, cycle parking silos. Um, so we, we haven't got an installation of that yet in UK, uh, but we're talking to a lot of people about that now, and we can see that coming along. Um, certainly systems, all of our systems can be used for general storage. Uh, we're talking to certain people about battery systems and all sorts of building integration so that those, those parts can be easily accessed. Um, EV chargers, obviously, we know that most of our customers now on, on most of our existing systems, they're getting more and more clients with electric vehicles. So we're starting now to put EV chargers on all of our older systems, but all the new systems come with a standard set of parts for EV charging. Um, and we've even been talking to a lot of developers for three. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so what I thought I would do is just show you as a, a, a final um, idea, rather than just look at pictures, to just show you a video of a system actually in operation. Um, so you can see somebody actually using it, which is just a one minute video.
thank you all for your time. I hope you've got something out of that and enjoyed it. And, and I think we're going to ask any questions that, uh, that you need. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, I'm kind of interested, really, I mean, you talked about the three systems that you have here. Um, the uh, park lift, the combi lift, and the park safe. Can we get an idea really about what are the what are the relative costs of the associated with the use of any of these systems, just in ballpark figures? Because I've never really quite got my head around that. I mean, what are you looking at if you're building above ground, say, yeah, three systems. I mean, when, if one's alpha, how much plus alpha is the, are the other two systems? Just so people have a sense of it. It, that's a, it, it's, it's a good way to, to hold in your head, and, and often I have that conversation with, with a lot of architects. The stackers are the base price. Um, I mean, they vary, um, but as soon as you go to a combi lift, semi-automated systems, you're almost doubling the cost per parking space, a stacker compared with a combi lift. So we, we do lots of sort of pricing exercises and say, well, okay, that system is going to cost X, but it's perhaps going to save that amount of concrete, that amount of excavation, plus we can get that many more apartments because we've used this area. It's worth it. Sometimes it isn't. You go, oh, no, stackers are fine. They will do the job. Um, automatics, they do vary considerably. Um, you know, it, they, they tend to have a high fixed cost. I mean, the reality is, you know, a, a, an automatic system is never going to be less than around about three quarters of a million pounds installed. And that doesn't matter whether it's five spaces up to, say, 30 spaces, if it's going to be that fixed cost. So you, the bigger the system is, the more advantage you have, you know, with, with, with cost. Um, and then there's different systems in that that do vary a lot. We, 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 we're just doing one, a, a private automatic system in London at the moment, which has only got seven spaces on it, um, which is per space is excruciatingly co costly. Uh, but, you know, the, the guy wanted it. He's got a very, very small amount of space. He loves his cars. It's for a car collection. Where you get the other end of the spectrum, um, we, the, our biggest system in the UK is a, a 339 space system at the Cube in Birmingham. And that was a pilotless system. And um, that, I mean, at the time that went in about 2008, uh, racking my brain now, it was around about £7,000 per space installed. Mm -hmm. So it, that really even made it cheaper than a multi-storey car park. So th there's a huge spectrum, particularly with, with automatics. Okay. And just one quick question. I know that we're, we're pushed for time, but I just want... Mm. Uh, could you just kind of like get, help me kind of work out why it is that actually in, in building regulation kind of um, thinking that actually um, car parks tend to be really low on the risk level? Because I've always thought, well, you've got cubic, you know, cubic tonnes of petrol sitting around in these in these structures, but actually they're considered low risk in terms of regulation, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, I often sit in design team meetings talking about, you know, fire routes and distances and what increased, I mean, from my point of view, what, what increased um, combustion material I'm putting in there by perhaps putting cars together in stacks and racks um, generally, the, the fire department in London thinks about a car fire as around about eight megawatts. So they will take a whole strategy and say, OK, if we've got this amount of cars conventionally in that car park, we've got 20 cars. But if we put stackers in, suddenly we've got 40 cars, we've got a bigger combustion material in that area. And then that's got to be mitigated by fire strategy so what happens yeah. in the case of fire how do people escape how do we extract fumes how do we insulate this because the, the, the most important thing i mean the reality is cars are bits of metal and they're not important it's people yeah so yeah. what we want to do and everybody's interested in is making sure that enclosure whatever happens in it is either suppressed so we've got sprinklers or something in there or it's enclosed so yeah. there is a fire strategy that closes doors extracts smoke and deals with the fire while it's in there. I mean, I, I, over the years, I've talked to a lot of the technical guys at the fire department and, and their feeling and their, their, their push to, to us and architects and developers is we don't want to go into a, a, a garage fire, particularly. 
we want to see what's happening on the fire alarm panel, where it is. Let it go. Yeah, let it go. And, and let's see what the building does with it. So they want it to be suppressed. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Sorry, I'm getting my, my fingers wrapped here because I need to get okay. on. Okay, go there. But thank you very much indeed. Um, I think, I believe we're going back to Rob Cowan now. Is that the case? Check. Okay, excellent. Rob, are you five? Are you there? Oh, look, there he is. No, he's died. <laughs> Rob, are you there? Yes, yep, yeah, indeed. Good. Uh, Excellent. Love that cartoon. Good. Um, can I start? Yes. Uh, let's just see if I can make it bigger for me so that I can see where we are. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, now, can I operate that? Um, Right. Yeah, good. So are you, are you going to um, operate the slide for me? Right, right. So, so, so sorry, it wasn't, wasn't working. Do you, do you want to have a last try to see if I can share it? Uh, okay, good. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, there's the book and, and there's a, a link if you want to buy it. Next slide. Somebody asked me uh, recently to sum up the value of urban design in less than 50 words. So I, I drew a cartoon uh, and it is less than 50 words. Car-based housing development is building carbon profligacy into our way of life for generations. We can change our diet, we can put an end to single-use plastic, we can fly less, but once we've built our housing around the car, we're scuppered. Next. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a housing development in Sheffield. And the, the quickest way for walking, to walk from house A to house B, um, is uh, by following the, the dotted line, which is ridiculous. Next. So we're, we're building places that depend on cars, that people find it difficult not to move by car. Next. This is uh, the Venture Retail Park in Tamworth, and all the shaded area is car parking, uh, an incredibly inefficient use of land, an incredibly awful place, a place you wouldn't ever consider uh, walking around by, by foot. So we can do better than that. Next. There's uh, one thing about this book, Essential Urban Design, is there are no photographs in it. I'm sort of fed up with um, photographs of, um, uh, they're all the same about uh, uh, the latest urban design. Uh, and it's full of drawings, uh, either by me or by the best of uh, urban designers. This is Henry Wooten, next. Uh, Raymond Unwin, next. And Christopher Alexander, next. And a whole range of uh, precursors, pioneers, and practitioners of urban design over the centuries, from Vitruvius uh, to the modern day, next. I also talk about the concept, familiar concepts in, in, in urban design. Next. And here's a neat equation that brings them together. <clears throat> um, overgrown airfield plus unsustainable location equals brownfield site. Brownfield site plus mixed uses equals urban village. Urban village plus sustainable lo uh, location equals sustainable uh, uh, sustainable urban extension. Uh, sustainable urban extension plus government hype equals sustainable community. We now got up to uh, this was John Prescott, uh, and it's it's the same uh, familiar um, uh, concepts, but with, with with new terms. Sustainable community plus remote unsustainable location equals eco town. That was Gordon Brown. Uh, sustainable uh, eco town plus national planning policy framework equals garden city, which is where we are today. And this will continue. Next. Uh, 
other this illustration in the book uh, by Richard Guise, uh, showing how elements in the the uh, the urban landscape can give us a sense of scale, can be useful in designing. Next. Uh, one by Roger Evans showing uh, some issues of, of density. Um, the, each of the, the nine blocks is, is identical density. So if we're, if we're thinking about density, we don't start with thinking about a number. We think about what sort of place are we trying to create next? Uh, different scales of urban design, another drawing by uh, Roger Evans. Next. There's only one statistic in the book, um, uh, which is this, 94%, a good statistic. Next. 94% uh, of uh, master plans fail. Next. And the reason they fail is because we have uh, uh, absurd ex uh, expectations of what they can achieve. Generally, when a master plan fails, it's because it's failed to resolve conflicts between a wide variety of duties, regulations, policies, and so on. Um, these things control what development is able to happen on a particular site. And unless, unless we get to grips with them, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, make change happen. Um, and just by drawing a master plan isn't going to make change happen unless we control all these other things. Next. A good master plan tells a story. This is uh, Proctor and Matthews in the marsh in, in Kent, um, coming to terms with the, 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 the particular location and understanding uh, the historic development, uh, the, the historic form of settlements, uh, the historic uh, routes, and come out with a convincing uh, modern interpretation of them of how modern development can work on that site. Next. Massive small is a way of moving from traditional end state master planning and thinking, actually, what we need to do is to try and create the conditions where development can happen. Uh, next. This is uh, Massive Small's localia idea. So first of all, uh, setting out a, uh, some, a local authority or a government agency needs to do this, but this is the way, or, or, or a large private organisation, but probably a public organisation, um, to set out the structure uh, which will work. And then let, uh, not just volume house builders, but a, a whole load of uh, individuals or small organisations and cooperatives um, to, uh, to develop the site gradually. Next. And they don't have to develop it first as it's going to be uh, ultimately next. Uh, it can develop over time uh, as normal places do. Um, but we just need to create the first conditions that'll let that happen. Next. Uh, Metropolitan Workshop uh, have a, a similar uh, scheme called Homestead, which is in a way the equivalent of the, the, the Victorian urban block a standard form that can be plugged into a system uh, and that provides a, uh, a variety of uh, choices of, of development, different characters uh, with the, uh, the, the parking pushed to the, the edge of the site, uh, but which can be developed gradually and to, to form a successful urban system. Next. Eight design objectives for development. What are we trying to achieve? It's not just successful uh, public space, which is what urban design is sometimes thought of, but these eight, eight things, eight elements, and the book describes how they can be used to analyze places uh, and also to design places, to make sure uh, that they, they achieve these objectives and whichever in the particular site is, is most important, but they're all always all relevant. Next. It's not just places, but routes that we can improve by urban design. Uh, so an, an existing fast country road next. Planting, avenue planting introduced, new development on either side facing the street. Next. 
uh, a visual gateway created by placing some buildings at the, at the back of the street. Next. Uh, the streets narrowed by foot and footpaths are built. Next. Uh, traffic lights and a small landmark building are placed at street connections. Next. Uh, and we move from this next to this, creating what was a, just a, a fast road into a place that maybe becomes the high street of the new development around it. Not just a road for, for traffic, a road that takes traffic, but is also usable by uh, cycles and, uh, and pedestrians. Next. The uh, current planning reforms, which are now on hold, um, uh, gave a, a very um, uh, prominent part to design codes uh, as a way of improving uh, urban design. Um, but actually design codes are, people uh, call a whole load of things design codes. Next. Um, there's a, a whole range of design guidance and and some design guidance is highly prescriptive, some is advisory, uh, some relates to plots, some to larger areas such as uh, uh, areas or, or, or whole towns. And generally design codes are highly prescriptive uh, on a small scale um, because it's difficult to be highly prescriptive on a, on a large scale. Uh, next. So we need to decide if um, design codes are, are going to be appropriate. But if they are, we need to make sure that we've got the, the resources um, to, to make them work. And this is a, a, a suggested structure of what you need to do to, to, to make a, a successful design code. So you need to have the right inputs, the right skills, and you need to have the, the right process to be able to use the design code. Uh, it's not just a, uh, a simple thing you, you draw up and then press the button. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of a, a long process over time. Next. So what's this? Well, it's, um, it looks like a pavement, uh, but, uh, but it's too wide, for, uh, too narrow for anyone to uh, walk along. I mean, for a, a parent and a child to walk along or for a, a, a wheelchair to navigate. Uh, actually, what happened is this was meant. It was drawn on the on the, uh, the, the 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 plan as two lines, which were meant to indicate uh, where the the service strip was. Uh, and someone saw the, the the drawing and thought, oh, "Well, there's two lines there. It must be the pavement." So they built it. And at no stage in this process did the people who were building it, designing it, um, uh, specifying get together and ask the, the real question, what sort of place are we trying to create? What will it feel like to, uh, to, to, to be in this space? And that's the question that people need to ask. Next. And again, in this, this place, well, this is a, there's a patio door and a, and a little garden in front of the patio door. Did anyone think, uh, oh, people will be able to open the patio door onto the street and, and say to the children, next, uh, go out into the garden and play. Well, it's not a big garden, but uh, you know they're not big children. Uh, but no, it's 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 nobody actually did any urban design. It's it's a standard unit, and the standard unit happens to have uh, patio doors on it. And, and nobody actually thought about uh, how people would actually use that entrance if it is an entrance uh, and that that garden space if it is a garden space. So pe people sometimes ask me, uh, well, you know, give us an example of successful urban design. So I do. And then they say, yes, but give us one that was built after 1940. And I say, well, that's more difficult. Next. But here's, a, you know, here's an example. This is uh, McGrath Road housing. Uh, in the London Borough of Newham by Peter Barber Architects. Um, the brief was to build uh, affordable housing and the client expected a couple of uh, apartment blocks of small flats. Peter Barber sort of next, 
reinvented um, housing and thought, actually, if we took all the space of the, the lifts and the common areas and the entrances uh, of the apartment blocks and gave it to the individual flats, we'd be able to uh, create a development in which everybody has their front door. And, uh, and they're, they're, they're tall, thin houses, um, generally uh, one main room on each floor, connected by a spiral staircase, staircase with the living room on the, on the top floor. Um, and in instead of the living room's um, uh, windows facing out into the courtyard, they face to the side into a bit of private um, uh, open space. A really clever way of trying to create something that's uh, a, a, a really uh, imaginative uh, way of providing housing with their own front doors for people, not, not for everybody, not for old people who don't like climbing stairs, but for, for young people, fit people who um, want affordable houses. Next. And another one, uh, similar in a way, a very different form by As Sacular Architects, the, the Marlings in Newcastle. Again, the brief was provide um, relatively low cost housing uh, on this uh, urban site. Um, and again, the uh, uh, the uh, the client expected apartment blocks, uh, but the architects, uh, after a long consultation, uh, next managed to create uh, a, a, a a real a real street and a real development that uh, again in which every house has its own front door. There are no lifts, there are no common parts, there are no common entrances. All that. Um, space has been incorporated into the uh, into the houses themselves, um, and a case of urban designers really thinking creatively, not just about a standard solution, but about how uh, the particular site uh, can be connected with its neighbourhood uh, and how uh, a particular uh, sensitive form of development can be uh, created. So that's some successful um, design. Next. Thank you. And uh, as you can see, there's some, some of the copies of the book uh, uh, left, so I'll, I'll be uh, happy to uh, provide them. Uh, next, I like to end with a, an inspirational slogan. Um, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, next teach him to fish and he feed him and his family for a lifetime. Next, teach him to plan and he'll wish he had chosen the fish. Next. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I think I was most struck in that presentation with the uh, slide you had of the, uh, of the uh, pavement just kind of being creative because it's abstractly written down on a plan and you know drawn on a plan and someone just picked up on it and thought that's what it was and I think that kind of assumptive idea of what a plan really does and the idea that actually sometimes can pe people can just become designers can just become absolutely um, lost in the world of the two dimensions without thinking it uh, without having any thought for what the, the experience would be in three is really key that that's really fundamentally where, where master plans seem to fail and it's kind of a ridiculous example that you show but I think it actually is very very um, quite a jarring uh, example of what it is when you only ever think in two dimensions. Uh, I was kind of interested in the idea of you talking about the 94% of master plans fail and I was wondering when you think as an architect, maybe it's better not to master plan. I, I kind of look at those kind of contingent spaces that you tend to get less in London, but certainly not in London anymore, really. But you look at places like Berlin, where you get, you know, the Tempelhof Airfield, which is effectively an absolutely massive development in the centre of an um, airport in the centre of a city, that's kind of run wild and kind of become absorbed really into all the housing around it. And you, can, I kind of wonder, when do you think it's better to just not urban design? Well, if you if you look at the in our our cities um, with you know Victorian and Edwardian uh, Edwardian streets, um, they weren't generally master planned. Um, the the streets were laid out, and and people understood how a street worked, um, and they understood in a particular location 
sort of how wide the street should be and how wide the pavement should be, um, and probably how how far the the houses would be set back from the street edge. Um, and then somebody laid out the street, maybe the landowner uh, or some other agency, um, and then they they sold off the plots and people would buy one plot or six plots um, or maybe a dozen plots um, and and build houses and they would build them not all at once they build them when they when they got the money um, and they would be generally a, a similar height and a, uh, probably a, a similar materials and style because that was the style of the time or those were the materials that were available or in fashion and the the result is streets which 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 work which were which were built and they didn't have to be designed uh, um, in in detail in, in the master plan and the trouble with the master plan is just generally they're trying to do things that are that are impossible because uh, in in effect, in any any site that we're master planning already has dozens of sort of master plan. You know, there's a the the, the highway engineering um, regulations, um, either national or or the or the, the the highway authorities, which specify you know what ha, what sort of roads uh, have to be um, built and uh, and what form they will take. And once you've got that, you know, you've practically um, you practically designed the, uh, the the development, you know, in its really important things, which is the the road layout. Um, so unless you're going to be able to challenge that, um, uh, you know, you're you're going to do a, a master plan that that, that that isn't going to be successful. And mm -hmm. there's a whole load of other regulations, which you know, unless you can combat them, you know, you're wasting your time trying to do. A, uh, prepare a master plan that, that that doesn't understand all these details. Um, there's a question here, actually picking up on that. There's a question from Mike Louis here quickly. Um, do the examples offer inclusive and accessible housing? Lift lamps and single living level housing apartments serve a purpose. Um, how do you kind of like incorporate? I mean, you were talking about bigger issues, but um, how do you incorporate things like inclusive and accessible housing within those? Because obviously, you look at the Peter Barber stuff, and he's always said that, in a, in a sense, he, he acknowledges it himself that steps or the insistence on having level access and stuff like that kind of puts pay to any of his more imaginative designs because obviously you're dealing with you know accessibility requirements. And I think it's, you know, he loves the idea of multi level living, for instance, split level living, but that simply doesn't happen when you're dealing with accessibility requirements, does it? Yeah, we we need to provide a, a variety, um, and and we, and we do also need to provide housing that will uh, be adaptable over time. Um, but um, well, certainly, you know, what an important uh, one one of the things that my book does in in going through those eight objectives is is talk about the objectives of of accessibility uh, and about what what those mean. Uh, and suggests of, you know, how designers, architects can think about how uh, how they're making the the development accessible in, in a in a whole uh, a whole number of ways. Uh, but certainly, the um, uh, you know we need to take accessibility uh, very seriously. And if we are creating something that um, uh, you know, like Peter Barber's. Uh, Houses, uh, you know, which are uh, relatively difficult to access. We need to understand exactly why we're doing that and how that fits in with uh, the the housing uh, that we're providing in general, and and how it fits into that uh, local area. So, if if those particular houses uh, aren't uh, fully accessible, well, how are we creating a, a neighbourhood that that is accessible and does offer a, a wide variety of uh, choices? Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Rob. Uh, we got one comment here from T.G. Vanner that said, marvellous and refreshing talk. I have to say it was quite, um, it felt like a Pecha Kucha event. It's like every new slide every 15 seconds. It was quite a very fast pace, Rob. There we go. Um, finally got there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I have been asked to say that, uh, Rob, your book, Essential Urban Design, is available at ribabooks.com. So if you go to uh, the Reba Bookshop, 
I believe there's a 20% discount available if you put the code PIP Urban Design into the little box there before you buy your book. Um, so I hope, uh, please take a look at the book um, as and when you can. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Rob. Uh, we're moving thank you, Carlos. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we're moving on now to do have time, I believe. Yes, before the little break. Uh, we are going to move on now to William Matthews from William Matthews Art Associates. Um, hello, William. William Matthews worked at Renzo Piano Building Workshop um, for from 1994 to 2012, completing several internationally recognized projects, including the Fondation Berlay in Basel, Potsdamer Platz Berlin, and the Modern Wing of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, from 2001 until it was completed in 2013, he led the Shard Design Team and established William Matthews Architects in 2013. Uh, together with the acclaimed Belgian engineer, Neon as they were responsible for the beautiful Sterling Prize nominated this year, Tintagel Bridge, a stunning example of light touch engineering, merging structure and symbolism in a profound yet understated way. Uh, to explain his take on Arthurian legend, William, are you there? I am. I, um, good morning. Can, uh, you can hear me, which is good. I can, yeah. <clears throat> Great. Um, yes, thank you, Ian Carlos and the RIBAJ for inviting me to talk. Um, I thought I might save myself a few minutes of talking by actually showing you a film, a beautiful film produced by Jim Stevenson of Tintagel as a quick introduction to the project. I think as children, we all came to Tintagel and none of us remember it. It's one of those sort of mythical places that we've all heard about and visited, maybe in our dreams, maybe in reality. It's hard to imagine that in the third and fourth century, the population of Tintagel was greater than London. The Arthurian legends really started with the books of Geoffrey of Monmouth, who wrote that Arthur was conceived here. He wasn't born here, he was conceived here. Obviously, those stories became very important in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. And Richard, Earl of Cornwall, decided that he was going to build a castle here and that he might inherit some of those Arthurian powers. The Victorians then picked up in Arthurian legends and tourism was starting. And the, the Victorians started coming to Tintagel again to pick up a little bit of that magic. Here we are today with all of those different layers, the 5th century, the 12th century, the, the small bits of Victoriana, which make it such a fascinating and magical place. Bridges can take many forms. Their function is quite simple. I go from A to B. I cross a road, a river, a railway. It's hard to imagine that a thousand years ago, uh, where we're standing now in the mainland ward, was connected to the island. There was actually an isthmus of rock that connected the two with a small drawbridge in the middle. And in a mere thousand years, which is a, a smidgen in geological time, that is eroded away. And now we have this significant gap, this 65 meter wide gap between the, the mainland and the island. Coming to the site, you're thinking, how are we going to integrate this into the landscape? It is a scheduled ancient monument, it's cliff faces, site of special scientific interest, all of these things. And then you see the site and you think, forget that how on earth are we going to build a bridge in this location? And actually those, those very constraints led us uh, towards a cantilever solution. The great advantage of a cantilever solution is that we could bring it in in small elements using a cable crane, and at any point of the construction, it was stable. It wasn't relying on temporary formwork like an arch would. 
And again, that's one of the things that pushed us towards the idea of, of two cantilevers that reached out from either bank and almost met, but not quite in the middle. For the deck, we have 40,000 hand-split slates quarried just four miles away from here at Delabol and laid on edge. And they give this lovely, slightly crunchy feel as if you're walking on after eight minutes as you cross. People talk about the gap in the centre of the bridge and it is a, it's a key design feature. There's a technical necessity. Steel expands and contracts with temperature and the bridge needs to move. But there was a much more important idea and that was this idea of a threshold of going from the mainland to the island, from going from the, the present to the past, reality to legend, all of those sort of magical things that Tintagel is famous for and attract so many people to it. Um, I was going to say thank you to the film. Well, yeah, I suppose thank you to the film. Thank you for Jim for making, a, uh, I think, a, a, a wonderful film. I hate hearing myself speak. One of the advantages of talking now is I don't have to hear myself speak. Um, this is a, a view of the bridge from above, um, but obviously when we started, this is what uh, Tintagel looked like. And I think one question, one valid question is, why a bridge? Um, Tintagel is one of English Heritage's most visited sites. On a peak day, it can get over 3,000 visitors. And on those peak days, you could easily queue for 45 minutes to get onto the island, 45 minutes to get off the island, in the days of social media uh, and TripAdvisor, et cetera, um, people complained a lot and it was, it was harmful, so to speak, for, for, for English heritage. So we, we won the competition, it was an international competition. We were one of six shortlisted teams and we won. We did look at lots of different options. Should it be a truss? Should it be an arch? Should the structure be above the deck? Should it be below the deck? And we went through quite an analytic um, process to analytical process to actually determine which design we felt was, was most appropriate, not just architecturally, um, but also how could we, uh, as I said in the film, how could we actually build this bridge on the site? And there was that key other element, the idea of some kind of poetic value. Um, Tintagel is a very romantic location, and the idea of these two halves reaching out and uh, creating this, this, this threshold in the middle. Cantilever construction is, is nothing new. It was actually Julius Caesar's uh, favourite uh, way of building a bridge and probably the most iconic bridge in the UK. The fourth rail bridge is obviously a, a cantilever construction. And it does give you this, this great advantage that you can you build it in segments. You can build it in small pieces. There's no formwork required. It's actually more stable when it's short than when it's long. Um, and that, that really... Um, in many ways, was the defining feature or the thing that decided it for us. The bridge itself is 65 metres long, two and a half metres wide, um, two segments, one that's uh, 34 metres long, the other one that's uh, 31 metres long. I'm never quite sure why we, we they weren't uh, equal. Um, it is a cantilever, so uh, we have two abutments, um, uh, upper abutment and the lower abutment. The, abutment, the upper abutment has either six or eight rock anchors going 16 meters into the rock, which tie the, they are generally in traction, in tension. The lower abutment um, generally always in, in compression. Um, if there's an uplift on the bridge due to wind, it could potentially go into tension, but um, generally in compression. So a much shorter and single rock anchor that, that ties the, the bridge into the, into the cliff face. Bridge was fabricated by Underhill, a, a company, a steelwork fabricator in, in Plymouth, so very nearby. The two halves were fabricated side by side and as a sort of effectively a test assembly. 
um, <clears throat> and using a uh, really the highest grade materials possible. So uh, here are the connection pieces. Each segment, the bridge is divided into 11 segments of five tons. Each connection piece is made out of duplex stainless steel, so effectively uh, corrosion resistant. Those are then welded onto the, the mild steel cords. All of the other elements of the bridge, the cross bracing, the steel trays that hold the deck, and the balustrading is all electropolished uh, duplex stainless steel. Installed using a cable crane, here you can see the actual cable crane uh, in place with the um, pylon on the left. And uh, it is what it says on the tin. It's a, it's a, a crane that goes along a cable rather like a cable car. Uh, indeed, these, these uh, things come from the Alps and they're used to install cable cars. And um, we, the, the cable weight is exactly on the alignment of the bridge. And we bring the, the various segments in in sections and drop them into place. So here are two of the sections made the short journey from Plymouth to Tintagel on, on the back of a truck. Anybody who's been to Tintagel will know how what a small village it is and how uh, difficult this was actually getting these elements through the village. So then placed onto a low loader down the steep uh, path and uh, you can see here a section being loaded, uh, connected to the cable crane um, with, its, with its five ton capacity, then along the cableway and, and dropped into place. We actually, although the construction period for the whole bridge was, um, was, it was 10 months, we actually installed the bridge in three weeks. Uh, we'd planned for one section a day, one of these pieces a day, and at peak, we did three pieces in a single day. As soon as each section was in, the deck, the trays could go on and the balustrading could be fitted. So it became a safe working environment. Um, is it really cantilever? Yes. Um, some people have questioned that. Uh, but uh, I think here's the proof in some, some ways. It, um, there was a point when we had um, a 35 meter diving board. Um, Half of me rather liked it if it <laughs> left like this, actually. It's quite a sort of stunning piece. But yes, it, it's, it's a real cantilever. And <clears throat> now I'm going to finish just with a few um, images. Um, for anybody who has been to Tintagel, you'll know what a, what a remarkable place it is and how the weather can change in, in a split second. But you, you always get these wonderful views and how the, the bridge really does connect the, the two halves of the, um, of the medieval castle and how fascinated people become by that funny gap in the middle, um, suspended 35 meters above the waves. There we are. I finished. Thank you very much indeed, William. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to, I mean, certainly it must be a pleasure for you to just be have so many beautiful images of that project. It just in every shot that you show, it just keeps on getting better. It's a, it's a stunning design and an absolutely stunning sight, I have to say. Um, always a pleasure to look at them. Uh, I I'm kind of just, I mean, just in terms of the bridge design, is there any liveliness in the bridge at all? Because I've I've I always kind of miss the fact that the millennium. <coughs> They took the complete bounce out of the Millennium Bridge. I know obviously it was very problematic at the beginning. I quite like the idea that something so thin and so um, slender uh, with such a large span actually um, had a sense of actually being a bridge and kind of taking you from solidity to that kind of ephemeral sense of being in, you know, suspended in the air. And I kind of wonder, is there any of that at all on the bridge? Do you get a sense of, of slight movement or not? Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely lively. Um, we, um, with the client, we actually did an assessment. We took them to a, um, a lab in, in Belgium where you're stuck on a platform and you're given various vibrations and told whether you, you tolerate that or not. Um, we upped the grade a little bit, um, but it, it definitely moves. It has, we have lateral uh, tune mass dampers and vertical tune mass dampers. Um, without, the, and the tune mass dampers, they really work. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just over 60 kilos. On my own, 
without the two mass dampers, I could get the bridge to move about 100 mil up and down quite, oh, quite that's, easily. Yeah, that's quite a lot then, yeah. Yeah, without the, with the tune mass dampers, I can't get it to move at all. Um, they, they, they're very effective. And the other thing is actually when you, the more people you have on the bridge, the more stable it is. Um, so, um, and, and generally there's, there's always 20, 20, 30 people on the bridge at any one time. So it, it's, um, it's got some movement. It's, but it's not, it's not a thrill ride by any means, but it's, it's got some, yeah, some movement. It's fun. So you've taken on board the fact that people tend to start walking in. I mean, that was the problem with the Millennium Bridge, wasn't it? It was the idea that people, you always assumed random movement of people. And in fact, what happens is people start moving in, in, in rhythm with the actual movement of the bridge itself. And that's what people didn't really consider about in, during the engineering of it, was the idea that people will start to walk together in a sense, which only exacerbates the movements. I, I think also that, you know, the modelling we've got is much more advanced than it used to be. Um, and knowledge, understanding, et cetera, is, is, has come on a long way. Um, so we, we can design these things out. We can predict fairly precisely how the bridge will react. Uh, we've got a question here that says, <laughs> please explain duplex stainless steel. Actually, that's, yeah, because I just thought you could put like 316 or 304 stainless steel. Yeah, the, there are different grades. Um, 304 um, is is not really stainless. It stains quite a lot. Yeah. Um, the 316 is, is stainless, but will still stain. Um, duplex is, is the highest grade of stainless steel you can get. Um, it is... Uh, I always find it funny that the Germans call it rust-free when it's definitely not rust-free. Um, and we're maybe a little bit more honest calling it stainless. But this is an extremely harsh environment. Um, and um, we were very concerned that the longevity of the connection pieces, if you do get corrosion in the connection piece, there's not much you can do. Um, and it will continue to corrode. We had 120 year design life in theory for the bridge, but we wanted to, it to last in uh, much, much longer than that. There's, there's no reason why this bridge can't last several hundred years. Uh, and that's that's thanks to the use of uh, the duplex in those connection pieces, which are then painted. You don't see that, but it is um, it is the highest highest grade of uh, stainless steel. The, what commonly used in construction, commonly is. Uh, we've got a question. Well, Adam Pearson saying it's poetic engineering, but his other question is more, more pragmatic. Is the bottom edge of the slate on a resilient surface in terms of the detailing? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> good question. We, we tried it on a, we did a mock-up and we tried it on a, uh, a rubber base um, and a, a thin little uh, uh, piece of rubber. We were concerned that that would degrade with time. Um, it, it would need replacing. Um, but actually, we found the experience of the, the trays when the, the trays are literally just packed in vertically. The under the, the bottom edge is is cut flat, uh, so it hasn't got the, the split edge on top. It's it's got a flat cut, and so they're sitting directly on the stale um, trays. And earth has started to to be accumulate in 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 between the slates. And uh, over time, they are they are getting packed in. We've added a bit of slate dust recently. Um, they're they're quite a popular souvenir, should I say? Unfortunately, so we um, we have to replace them quite regularly. <laughs> People look down to pick up, you know, to help their child and come away with a slate. Um, wow. But, um, anyway. <laughs> Well, it shows how much they love it. I mean, in an odd way, it's that idea of wanting to take something away of the memory, I suppose, you know, if you look at it. Yeah, uh, English Heritage had a, a marketing ploy to, for five pounds, you could have your name and a message written on written on a slate. And they were inundated with requests, which were quite long. And actually, they worked out they were losing money in the end, <laughs> writing all of these notes. But anyway, there are various marriage proposals and other things on the slates. Well, thank you very much indeed, William. It's so my Louis here says, in my humble opinion, this should, should have actually won the Sterling Prize, a truly beautiful piece of design and engineering. <laughs> why didn't it? Do you know why it didn't, William? I, I think um I think there are, there are good reasons why it didn't. Um 
I think today we tend to we judge huge amounts of architecture on what we see in the magazines and on websites and what have you. And we're actually judging architectural photography. Um, I would I was surprised when the um, the Kingston project won, but I hadn't seen it. And speaking to the judges, they said, you, look, you just got to go and see it. It's an amazing project. And so um, it wasn't just a, a, a clickbait um, competition of who did the most seductive. I mean, look, Tintagel is, is very photogenic. There's, there's no difficulty there. But it was nice in a way that something that didn't maybe shout out from the photos, but clearly was exceptional in reality, uh, won. That's extremely generous of you. Thank you very much, because it's a, it is a beautiful project. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering about just the one thing about should one earn experience and the idea of like going down the rock and back up, you know, the idea that one needs to kind of struggle in order to experience some things, but actually obviously in the modern world, maybe, you know, people, you know, we have accessibility requirements and everything, but mm -hmm. about whether that idea of struggle should be, in, you know, has sometimes been embedded in architecture, I suppose, going up there, you know, going up on your knees to the steps of St. Peter's if you're on pilgrimage or whatever. No, there is that sense that somehow architecture and struggle or physical struggle are sometimes interlinked. Yeah, I, mean, I think we, um, for, for many wonderful reasons, we live in an in inclusive age as opposed to an exclusive age. And um, uh, inclusivity was, was, was one of the raison d'etre of this, of this project. Well, thank you very much indeed. It was wonderful to look at it again, William. <coughs> thank you. Uh, I believe that we now have a five-minute break. You probably all learned on 10.17. We'll probably come back 10.22, 10.23. Um, we hope to see you after our break. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. I uh, hope you had your break. Uh, got your coffees and teas. Um, our next presenter is Rafaela Rosport, uh, Partner Associate at Western Williamson and Partners. Uh, hello. Well, hello. Uh, one of the first Elizabeth Line stations to be completed, uh, Western Williamson's 500 million crossrail station at Paddington is also one of the new lines more challenging, running a 21st century deep box station right alongside Brunel's wonderful grade one listed terminus. It now boldly runs along the south face of the station, I believe. We are now able to see the fruits of their labours. Um, it's the station I use quite a lot because I go back with my family there uh, on the West Country. So I've seen it since it's been, that whole kind of forecourt space has been opened up. Uh, and to give us a little insight into the project, um, Raphael is going to be presenting the Elizabeth Line station. Uh, Raffaella was recently awarded an RIBA Inspirational Woman Award and has been shortlisted in the European Woman in Construction and Engineering Awards in 2016 and 18. She was also shortlisted as Best Woman in Rail Awards in 2016 and her team also nominated for the Transport for London 2017 Collaboration Award. So the Paddington Station project, it seems, is just another feather in your cap. Um, take it away, Raffaella. Hello, hello. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning and, uh, and have the opportunity of giving you all some insights uh, um, into the challenges of designing and delivering a major uh, station in central London, like uh, the Elizabeth Line at Paddington Station. My name is Rafaela Rospo, and I've been working on the Elizabeth Paddington Station for the last 10 years with uh, uh, Weston Williamson. So Weston Williamson and Partners have been involved from the very early um, on uh, in the design uh, of two major stations along the Elizabeth Line, Paddington and Village. So those two stations are really different from any other on the line uh, because the others are tunnel stations, while those ones are top-down cut and cover construction, box stations. Um, and this means we had more freedom in the design of the stations and uh, and we did not use the white cladding which is used in the tunnel section of the Elizabeth line. 
Personally, I've been involved uh, in, uh, in the project uh, and very lucky uh, to be involved in those projects from the very early stages. And I saw the station growing from sketches on a piece of paper to its completion and end over a few weeks ago. And this is really a rare opportunity in the life of an architect. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. And uh, today I want to uh, talk about, uh, you know, to, to tell you a story, the story of a journey. But that story goes uh, uh, much before my involvement, and it's the story of uh, Paddington Station and the radical transformation of an area in London. At Weston Williamson, we believe uh, uh, really that all stations and particular interchanges uh, uh, like Paddington, big interchanges, are not the opportunity to design uh, great buildings, but also they have the potential to generate uh, civic spaces uh, and generate transformation which are necessary for the success of a city, in this case of London. So like every respectable uh, story, we will start with uh, Once Upon a Time. And uh, Once Upon a Time, uh, there was uh, a, a man called Brunel, and uh, one of the, he was one of the most ingenious and prolific figures, I would say, in engineering history. He was tasked to design the new terminus, which is London Paddington, and this was built uh, in, under his direction uh, in 1854. And uh, we look here at the historical context. On the left-hand side, we have uh, the approach uh, to the station. This is uh, the Partus Road, and this is uh, um, the station behind. So people would approach uh, the station. This is a road uh, gently going down at the entrance. There is a, a canopy, a um, Paxton canopy style. And then eastbound terrace on the other side here, divided by a railing. On the right hand side, you see how the station appeared in 1940s. Um, during, you know, it's got three spans, and one span was added in 1912, a little bit later. But uh, since this extension is in, in 1912, the station didn't see any major expansion expansion despite uh, the large increase of passenger numbers. And you can see it here how busy it used to be already. Uh, we are in more recent years. So here we are around 2005. Uh, this was the approach of the station. You see still the Parchus Road going gently down at the entrance of the station along Macmillan House, uh, which is a great listed building also designed by Brunel. And uh, the primary function of this road was a taxi rank and the pedestrians were confined on a very narrow uh, paving along Macmillan House. And the approach to the station happened in a, within a very dark environment, polluted because it was full of taxi and quite oppressive. So the arrival of the Elizabeth Line, of course, represented an opportunity to improve uh, the, not just the experience of uh, the passenger approaching the station, but really a rare opportunity to drastically change uh, an area of London and uh, you know, to, to change the way this listed building um, you know, uh, interact with the, with the city. The new crossrail alignment was planned to run under this taxi rank that you just seen. So before uh, the construction could begin, uh, it was necessary to move uh, the taxi rank on uh, uh, the other side, the canal side, we call it. And um, uh, so from the red to the blue square, you see at the top of the picture. Weston Williamson was invited to offer some proposal and um, design and deliver this uh, uh, taxi rank, but uh, we were also instrumental in persuading uh, London Underground to integrate uh, their plans for an upgrade um, to their Amersmith and City uh, line um, within this uh, project and also a new entrance from the canal side for the network rail. So these are some images of this project, which we call Paddington Integrated Project because it's you know in integrating different uh, stakeholders and some images of the new Amesmith and City uh, entrance and of the ticket hall and that is just at the end of the taxi rank. So we've seen what happened on one side of, uh, of, the, of the station, which we call canal side, the PIP side, what happened on the other side. 
So in 2008, uh, while the uh, PIP uh, project was uh, ongoing, Western Williamson bid for the Elizabeth station itself, and it was felt we were the best uh, place to own it, not just because we have uh, over 30 years of experience in international infrastructure projects, and we could maximize every opportunity in this context, but because we had uh, already a good understanding of the site, of all the issues, and uh, we, we knew how to deal with the stakeholders. So what was the challenge? The challenge was uh, how could we could create a new station, a new space that could complement the, the, the uh, Brunel's uh, station uh, without competing with it. So our vision was to do it uh, by creating a new external space that was acting as an entrance to the old station, but also to the new station. And um, we also try uh, to use the same language that Brunel used. Um, we use this uh, rigor by extending the station grid, the original station grid to the new urban realm, but also to the new station. We use an engineering approach to architecture and uh, a tectonic language exposing the structure, for example, and we will see it later on. We also use some um, decorative uh, uh, original Brunel motif uh, in our design. So all of this was really to make sure that there was uh, uh, an integration between the old station and the new station. And here we are. So this is the new approach to the station. It's very different from uh, what you've seen before. And uh, um, this uh, is a public space, uh, um, is at the center of uh, our uh, design, really. It's a civic space that connects the new with the old station. And uh, uh, when, once the, all the retails are uh, going to be there as planned, it will become a design, in it, you know, a destination in its own right. Uh, the images you see are not 3D images, they are the real thing. And we took them uh, at the beginning of September when the urban realm was open. And we hope uh, the station is, is, there, is still closed. So we hope it will, the space will be animated when the, the station will be open and the retail arrive. Uh, because of the predicted uh, passenger numbers, the access uh, to the main station was improved through the opening of existing uh, arches um, underneath Macmillan House. So this is a restored clock arch, but we also open a new one. So for example, this one is uh, what we used to call the cross rail arch. We can call it the Queen uh, Elizabeth Arch now. And uh, it's, uh, um, you can see in this image, for example, how the um, old station and the new station uh, connect uh, through uh, the public realm. And some images of, uh, of uh, the cladding in this case, and uh, uh, we were talking about Brunel motifs before. Here we are, this is one of the example. And uh, um, I'd like to put attention about uh, the, pedestra the, the to pedestrianize um, a road in London was really not easy. Um, and Weston Williamson and Crossrail really fought hard to persuade the relevant, uh, the relevant authorities to do it. But we made our case and we hope that this could become really a benchmark for the future, you know, to have this uh, uh, big uh, pedestrian plaza and, 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 and pedestrian the entire road. Um, the link between Isbon Terrace and the Partus Road uh, is reinforced visually by this big um, canopy at the top, uh, which provide uh, weather shelter. And in this context, really, the Partus Road and Isbon Terrace uh, um, can really be seen as an extension of, uh, of uh, Paddington Station, almost a fifth span, right? And uh, the new passenger will have a similar experience uh, of the passenger in the Victorian era. They are passenger, they are looking at the canopy and looking at the sky and beyond, and beyond it. Our... Uh, our story goes on and goes on with the passenger journey. So from the Partus Road, the passenger descend into the ticket hall through two banks of escalator, one in the east and one in the west. Uh, there is also a glass lift at the center. And this is quite unusual because PRM usually take the back entrance to a station, but here they are bang right in the middle of the, of the center of the space. 
the air, the light that the passenger can feel uh, once they are in the concourse level are exceptional for, uh, for the underground station. This is what very, is very um, particular about this uh, underground station. There is no feeling at all of being 20 meters below the ground. And uh, we, you know, we are very proud because also we started this, uh, um, this design when we couldn't predict a pandemic at all. And uh, this is a space where passenger wants to be, wants to be now, but we, we knew that this is the right space for passenger for improving their experience in an underground station. And these are some images of the concourse level. And uh, we go down now to the uh, platform and uh, at platform level, um, the, the journey also is uh, about uh, people coming out from, uh, from trains and coming out from the doors. Um, they will just look up and this is what they see. They see directly from the platform, the canopy and the sky and will be guided by the light. So the light is becoming, you know, a natural wayfinding for people to come out at the station. Looking at the station, so we can see that uh, it's a symmetrical space and the center of this space is the public space at both uh, the um, public realm and concourse level. And uh, uh, the station is fed by, uh, by both ends. And the most significant result uh, uh, is evident uh, uh, of this strategy is evident uh, uh, with the uh, two huge vent shafts, uh, which are in this location and in this location coming out uh, from, from the urban realm. Those are um, big buildings, uh, three story, uh, 30 meters long. And, uh, and you can see here um, some pictures of the vent shaft on both sides, here, here and on the other side of the canopy. And we were saying that we really want to integrate the, really wanted to integrate the, 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 the services within the structure, no? And uh, to expose the structure, this is the language we used within the station. And uh, you can see one of the example here, um, the contractor did a, magnific did a magnificent job here, no? To uh, deliver uh, these columns, which are in situ columns, uh, done in situ. And uh, the columns are 20 feet away. And the shape is like this because uh, uh, they absorb the, uh, the forces of the structure above, the shear forces. So this is part of the language uh, we were uh, talking about before. Behind uh, the column, you can see the soffit, and the soffit is formed by pre-cuts unit, uh, incorporated services, and uh, circular lighting in the center. Uh, this is a lily pad, is mounted at the center of these coffers, and is approximately one meter in diameter. And those lights are both decorative and, uh, and uh, functional. They provide with a punch line da light down the lux level, but also they, there is a hidden up lighter that lit the, uh, the, the uh, higher part of the, of the ceiling, lighting, la lighting up the ceiling. And um, those elements also incorporate uh, the, the, um, uh, the in, um, absorption, the, uh, um, the, pa the pad for acoustic absorption. And, um, and in terms of material, I'd like to talk about material a little bit as well. We deliberately use very few materials, uh, the concrete we've seen before, the bronze, uh, bricks, uh, they're all elements that uh, recall uh, the fact that we are uh, under the earth. No? This is an underground station, they're very earth uh, material, uh, they are uh, producing beautiful, uh, um, um, they, they, they reverberate the light in a beautiful way. And um, and uh, and they are uh, enhancing the warmth uh, of uh, of the space. And again, this is very uh, different from um, the usual underground station we've seen, and from the white cladding of the other crossrail station along the line. 
One of the biggest contracts was for sure the BRICS. Uh, we spent time to make sure uh, uh, we chosen the right one. Uh, we wanted a monolithic wall, so we play with the details, uh, not just here, but you know, uh, along all the stations, all the details are uh, really refined uh, to try to achieve what we wanted. And in this case, we played uh, with the joint. Uh, we made the joint uh, uh, being flush, for example. Uh, we uh, chosen the uh, very particular size of the brick, and uh, and um, and we also work with the subcontractor for again. Um, putting the insulation behind and for the integration of the superstructure. And you see here um, for the integration of the props, for example, and also the light, architectural light. We have worked with uh, 30 subcontractors, several stakeholders. And I would say that uh, communication and collaboration was really the key uh, for uh, during the design stage and also during the delivering uh, of the station. We review mock-up, uh, we work up details with subcontractors, uh, um, review exploring possibilities. Uh, and uh, it has been challenging. Um, I, um, definitely we had to fight for what was important and let go of other things. Um, and uh, of, of course, uh, you know, uh, value engineering while on site always knock at your doors. Uh, but we consider those, uh, uh, we try to consider those opportunities to improve uh, the project, to improve uh, our design, uh, our initial vision, and keeping uh, the architectural quality while bringing uh, some project savings. Um, so the height, uh, the, the light uh, that there is under the canopy and that descend into the ticket hall um, and then to the platform uh, like a cascade, uh, and the symmetrical space, uh, um, the, the, the urban and city um, landscape, uh, the civic space at the heart uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the project, everything recall a cathedral like uh, uh, rather than a station. And this is, I would say, is exceptional for a project of, uh, you know, of this kind. So that's, that's Paddington Station. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is me. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Raffaella. That was great. Wonderful. Um, I was kind of intrigued. I mean, it's, it must have been quite a difficult challenge, really, because like, as you say, there's, there's always that idea in terms of the architectural ego and wanting to kind of create something, I suppose, because you're next to such a great building in itself. It's such a stunning space. But I think what's interesting about the Brunel Stage, I mean, the Paddington, about Paddington itself, though, is the idea that it's in it itself is kind of like a cut, well, it's not really a fill, but it's certainly a cut station. So, what's interesting and, and, and in some ways wonderful about it is the idea that you don't really ever see it until you're in it, you don't get it. So, the uh, even rising up from an underground station into Paddington is an amazing experience. Whereas you've got more of a sense of it with obviously with King's Cross, St Pancras. Even Marleybone, certainly Charing Cross, because you've got the river to look across at it. You've got this idea that it's actually an architectural statement in itself. Brunel was kind of faced with the idea of cutting into the ground in order to kind of, you know, for the lower rates. So you don't really see it. All you see really are the terraces that run alongside it on the south side. So I think it's interesting that you chose to kind of respect that and, in a sense, keep quite a muted design rather than trying to do something to kind of zhuzh up the area, if you... Yeah. Yeah. I, I think really it was about integration for us. We didn't want uh, to have anything that was competing uh, with Brunel uh, uh, architecture, with Brunel structure. And uh, we actually use it uh, um, at our advantage. So we, uh, you know, we, we created a, a space, as I was saying at the beginning, that was, uh, could be uh, the, the, the entrance for both stations, uh, that was serving both stations, but also a space that could link uh, this existing station to the city and change, uh, and change the way people um, permeate um, from from both sides, the north side and the south side. Um, so it's really like a master plan, I would say. Um, and there are there were a lot of uh, you know stakeholders involved, uh, and it was difficult uh, to put them all together and uh, and realize uh, uh, these. Uh, um, that was one of the, the big challenge of uh, of the. 
um, of the project, you know, we had with Mister Network Rail, uh, TFLI, um, on the other side, uh, Taxi Rank uh, with LUL. So yeah, a uh, uh, complicated uh, yeah. project. I mean, you've, dealt, yes. you've dealt really well with the north and south side. I mean, obviously the station on the south, as you say, it's, it's, it's cathedral-like on that side. It is really wonderful. Again, on the north. How do you, is there anything going on really on the east? Because obviously there's, a, is it a Renzo Piano building going up on the east? Yes, uh, yes, of course. So, the whole yeah. area is now completely changed. When I arrived in Paddington 10 years ago, it was a completely rundown area. And this is what happened when, uh, you know, good uh, piece of infrastructure come. Then, you know, it just kind of uh, mobilized uh, and, uh, and, and revitalized the area. It happened in King's Cross. We see it in uh, in. Paddington with the Paddington Basin and all the projects that are coming um, on that side is really a fantastic uh, place. So when they, um, at the beginning, they said, oh, you're going to work in Paddington for a few years. I thought, oh, mom, I don't think it's a, it's a nice area of London, but here we are now. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to work there and to go there every day. I just want to say also that, uh, you know, when you see a project like that, uh, uh, sometimes I heard many times saying, uh, oh, the the, the devil is in the detail. And I must confess that uh, now that I've, I've been work on this station, I can say really that uh, behind good details, behind good design, uh, there's not the devil, but it's just about collaboration. It's about collaboration and about, uh, uh, you know, uh, dedication and resilience of all the people and good communication uh, of all the people that work together uh, to uh, kind of build and, and realize the vision uh, that was there from the beginning. So that, that's really the message from, from my side. Well, excellent. I look forward to seeing how you're going to actually develop the east side, which I still think is kind of problematic. I know you've got the hotel, but I mean, for me, there's just that road down on the east side that takes you into the station, which now, even now, is kind of remains Smokers Corner. It's very funny. It's where all the smokers congregate now. And I think that how that resolves itself in terms of allowing them to do that while still kind of creating good public realm, because clearly you can't smoke under that canopy, can you? So the smokers... Are be relegated to the east end of the station, but I want to see how that works out, really. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank question. you. I can't wait. I mean, Simon Khan here has left a comment saying, I can't wait for the Elizabeth line to open. There'll be so much to enjoy, quite apart from the idea of urban connectivity. And it's true. I do think it feels like the, it's on a slightly different nature, but actually you do get a sense that it feels like there's a kind of an excitement attached to it, which is a bit like the Jubilee line, the excitement. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, it, it, uh, it should be really good to kind of make a journey straight across. You know, that will be a real architectural journey, I imagine, for most uh, yeah, definitely. pilgrims. Uh, Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, uh, we'll open soon. So everybody will be able to uh, go across London. Uh, yeah, I look forward to not having to use the central line at peak time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, we are now moving on to our next presentation, which is from Zane Robinson at MAPE, uh, MAPE deal with uh, adhesive sealants and chemical products in the uh, construction industry. Uh, Zane's worked at MAPE for seven years as development manager, works closely with Transport for London and London Underground and other infrastructure projects, and offers insights, on-site and off-site support for projects in the infrastructure sector. He provides advice and guidance through materials and specification. He's a tiler and screeder by trade with 22 years of experience in both Australia and England across domestic commercial industrial projects. Um, are you there, Zane? I am here, yes. Great, excellent. Look forward to hearing what you've got to say. I'm going to introduce Steve. Are you there, Steve? Yeah, I'm here. Hopefully you can see me okay and hear me okay. Uh, Carlos, Steve's going to do the first part, covering uh, tunnels, etc., and then he'll pass it over to me. Excellent. Steve, all okay. to you. Good morning. Um, I trust everybody can see and hear me okay. So my name's Steve Price, and I've worked for MAPE now for about 17 years. Um, I'm a civil engineer by background, and we're moving away from architecture for a, a little bit here and uh, talking about the 
civil engineering uh, innovations in transport and infrastructure. Uh, and then um, after about eight or nine minutes or so, I'll hand you back to Zane and we'll talk about uh, the architectural um, innovations in the actual sort of station construction and that sort of thing. So a little bit about MAPE. Uh, we're a material manufacturer uh, and primarily a, an innovator. Um, at the core of what we do is quality. Um, so we are an ISO 9000 uh, accredited business, uh, 14,001. So we take very seriously uh, quality, um, safety and environmental issues are at the heart of uh, the way we operate. Um, in terms of environmental issues, uh, there are two standards uh, around the world. Um, internationally, we tend to find that um, projects work to the lead standard. So when we're working in the Middle East, when we're working in Asia, the States, uh, we tend to work to lead. Um, here in the UK, uh, we seem to like to do things a little bit differently. So we have BRIAM um, and we also work to BRIAM. So we have two environmental standards that we work to. Uh, we also work with BIM. We have a BIM library uh, with BIM models. Um, not so many when you are talking about tunnels, uh, because tunnels tend to be uh, segmental or sprayed concrete, um, obviously, um, uh, of different uh, sort of diameters, anything from about three metres up to about 14 metres, um, a tunnel as long as a tunnel needs to be. Uh, but when it comes to components, uh, you can find them in a BIM library. Um, and when it comes to the uh, station build-ups with flooring, tiles, screeds, heating, that sort of thing, uh, again, you can find them in the BIM library. So I mentioned innovation, and the first of two subjects I'd like to just introduce you to are innovations in tunnel waterproofing. Um, tunnels have to uh, generally have a design life these days of anything from 120 to 150 years. Uh, and in order to make a tunnel uh, last and give it the longevity that you need, you generally need to waterproof it and, and keep it dry. So I'm going to talk to you about two very different types of product, but actually they do the same job, and that is they waterproof a tunnel. Um, and we waterproof tunnels to the same standards that you would waterproof uh, a, you know, a domestic basement or um, a living space to. So we're talking about totally dry environments, um, with no uh, running water. If there's no water, then your steel work doesn't corrode and um, various other aspects don't, don't start to degrade over a long period of time. So the first innovation is a, a round of material called Maplastic TU, and this is what I'm going to talk about for the next few slides. Um, the innovation is that until MAPE uh, brought this kind of system to the market about four years ago, um, the only uh, accepted way of spraying a waterproof material into a tunnel was to use something called an EVA polymer. Um, and this is a powder blended with cement. So traditionally, and if we look at tunnels in the UK, like, for example, um, some of the Crossrail tunnels, mm. Hindhead tunnel uh, that are waterproof, they've all been done with an EVA polymer. Um, and this is bags of cement that need to be uh, uh, Manual, manually handled, uh, mixed with water. So you've got manual handling, you've got mixing, you've got dust being given away, you've got potential product variability because you're relying on the operator to put the correct amount of water with the correct amount of powder. Um, you've then got to have mixers and uh, high air pressures to transport that material. Uh, and high air pressures mean that you have a lot of uh, rebound and fairly heavy plant. So this is a traditional approach. It, it produces uh, safety concerns with dust. It can produce uh, manual handling concerns with equipment. Um, and uh, uh, it's generally quite sort of difficult for the operator. So our innovation, if we can come on to the next slide, is a ready mix product. So absolutely no dust because it's already a liquid. Um, no doubt about um, the final formulation because it's not actually being manufactured by the operative, it's already made in a factory. Very lightweight spray equipment um, that can be easily handled, um, mounted into the drum of the product, um, and extremely lightweight spray nozzles. It's like waterproofing a tunnel is suddenly like spraying a car. 
um, you can imagine that you can get into sort of very fine areas uh, and waterproof very effectively. So that's our innovation. Uh, and I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about that with the, uh, the next couple of slides, if I, if I may. So we've eliminated dust. And in fact, um, the last NCE uh, tunneling awards, we were a winner in the innovation category for health and safety because it's the first dust-free system for waterproofing. Um, there is no waste packaging. Uh, no, the, the drums are completely recycled. Uh, no solvents. This is a water-based system, so there are no solvents or chemicals involved. Um, all the equipment is cleaned with water. Uh, and importantly, for projects in London, it's an approved system uh, by uh, LUL on their, uh, their register. So uh, it's a truly sort of uh, uh, universal in innovation. Um, it provides a flexible barrier uh, to stop water moving from the substrate through the primary lining. Then we have our barrier. Then you have a final lining. So it's a, it's a flexible barrier. It's non-reactive. Um, it's a water-based polymer, very flexible, 300 degree, um, sorry, 300% flexibility, um, which is uh, really quite extreme. So it will accommodate minor movement and cracking and it will flex and uh, remain watertight. Uh, and the equipment that, you, that uh, applies the material is a, a very simple single uh, mono pump. One very critical um, aspect, uh, and we'll come on to the next slide, please, um, is the, the bond strength. With this kind of system, you are bonding the final lining with the primary lining. Um, and that means that the two linings act as one, uh, meaning that you can reduce the overall thickness of lining material in your tunnel, which is quite a considerable saving on materials. Uh, and in this day and age also, actually, it's a saving on CO2 because you're not putting so much concrete, uh, which contains cement into your tunnel construction. So that's quite important. That bond strength um, is in excess of one megapascal. Um, and that's quite a, a critical value that we can achieve. So just to summarize in the next couple of slides, uh, the, the innovation is that it is a ready mixed product um, supplied in 260 kilogram drums, as you can see here. It is actually applied in two layers, so it comes in two colours. The pumping equipment and the gun are very lightweight, as you can see. Um, we operate uh, contractor training. So what we see in this slide, and I'm not sure that the video is going to work on the next slide here, but we train contractors. So you can see here contractors at our training centre being trained with operation of the pumps, mounting the pumps into the product. And then on the next slide, which is normally a video, but I don't think it's going to work. Oh, yes, it is. You can see how a contractor is actually trained to apply the product. So this is one square meter. And as you can see, the application rate is extremely fast uh, to waterproof one, one square meter. Um, in terms of project references, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about where it's been used uh, out, elsewhere in Europe. But we have completed very successfully one of the largest projects in the UK, which is Bank Station in London. So all of Bank Station has been waterproof with this particular system, um, and uh, it's been 100% successful. Are we able to go on to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So in addition to Bank Station, which is the uh, most recent project reference and is here in the UK, uh, we also have references in Europe, which includes this particular slide that you can see, which is the mm. Opera Metro station in Paris. Now, once this material is applied, um, you would then either spray or cast a secondary lining onto the material. So that's the, the next slide, please. OK, and that's what you can see here. So you can see in the background the waterproofing layer in the tunnel. Um, and then in this application, you can see a final lining of shotcrete being applied directly onto the waterproofing layer. So that's the first innovation. And it's a ready to use, spray applied, dust free, no solvent uh, waterproofing system for tunnels um, with a design life in excess of, I'm going to say, 125 years for that one. But in fact, it may be a little bit longer. The second system is uh, a more traditional system. Um, it is a 
what's known as a sheet membrane system. So we call it Map Elastic, uh, Mappy Plan TU. Um, we have a design life with PVC in excess of 150 years. Um, this system, in fact, all waterproofing systems will exceed five bar water pressure. Again, they exceed 300% elongation. Um, thank you. And it can be applied to uh, cast or sprayed uh, secondary linings. Uh, the examples here you can see are crossrail. So this is the Farringdon station. So this is where you can see a um, cross passage and the two um, main concourse areas. Uh, the next slide shows how the secondary lining is applied. And then finally, I'll go through this very quickly. It was Farringdon, 35,000 square metres. The project is completed and is 100% successful. If we can just show the next two slides, please. You can see it's two platforms, 10 cross passages, um, and then the two ticket halls that were waterproof. Next slide. Okay, you can see a plan. The final slide then is the system. So we have a regulating layer, fixings, a PVC membrane that is welded. Uh, and you can see there then that um, this is applied directly to a shotcrete primary lining, and you would cast a secondary lining onto this. If we could have the next slide, please. Okay, you can see how water bars are fitted and injection hoses. And then the next slide. Uh, and then just a few more application shots uh, for this particular system. We have a number of slides now which just show the application. If we could run through those fairly quickly, you can see there the invert, which is where you start um, working your way up to the crown um, with welding of the membrane in place. And then finally, if we could have the next slide, uh, we can see a couple of shots of how we tested the water and water bars and injection hoses with uh, mock-up beams uh, and, in, and injection. You can see there how the acrylic comes out of the injection hoses and travels along the water bars. Okay, the last slide before I hand over to Zane uh, is that it was an entry in uh, 2017 uh, for the Tunneling Awards uh, because it was used on the Farringdon Station. Okay, that was extremely quick, but... Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll now hand you over to Zane just to tell you a little bit about the uh, station side of things. Thank you, Zane. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so MAPA UK has a vast experience in manufacturing supplied with construction materials for the rail and underground sector. The following slides aim to provide an overview of the types of materials MAPA can offer across multiple product lines with emphasis on fast track systems. The goal is to provide products that are tested for compatibility with each other to provide floor and wall systems. The vast majority of products mentioned in this presentation are approved on the LUL register. So over the years, MAPA have proven to be a key partner to everyone working in the building industry and has created thousands of specific products and properties, uh, characteristics to meet all their needs from waterproofing, uh, private swimming pools, until soundproofing theatres, restoring historic buildings, MAP has something for every sector of the building industry with products and solutions with guaranteed increased ductility and savings in materials and energy. MAP are pleased to offer a range of solutions for the following type product types, fast track screeds, leveling compounds, damp proof and tanking membranes, adhesives for tiles, resilient and wood flooring, tiles and grouts and sealants, resins and cementitious floor finishes. So this slide covers a typical build-up for station floor or concourse, ticket halls, etc. Um, so we'll just get into that a little bit more. So you have your concrete slab, a separating membrane, our uh, top shim rapid drying screed, um, high strength tile adhesive, and our ultra-colour grout. So the top shim screed you can tile on after 24 hours. The granny rapid tile adhesive you can grab after three hours and set for traffic after 24 hours. So all these products were developed with time in mind and program. Um, so we'll move on to the next one. Again, station concourse, you have the same type of build-ups. Slight different product range depending on the environment and what you're trying to achieve. Um, you'd have different primers for different substrates as well. Um, again, top chem, 24 hours. Nevo Rapid is four to six hours. Granny Rapid, again, is, is rapid drying and also the grout. Um, on this 
particular side, it would be a minimum three weeks saved on program. As we know, time is money. Um, this one covers like roof terraces, podium decks and roofs. So different range of products again, all with time in mind. So you'd have the same screed. You'd use map elastic turbo, which is a waterproofing membrane that is rapid drying. You've got a reinforcement mesh that is sandwiched between two layers of the map elastic turbo. And around the uh, corners, you'd have a fully flexible band that is a part of the system to give you 100% watertight uh, terrace. And then you can tile that, of course, with uh, rapid drying uh, tile adhesive um, or, or, or resin or whatever you want to do on top of that. So that's that one. Uh, this is for mainly back of house, corridors, loading areas, storage areas, different system again. Um, this is a mappy floor system. It's an epoxy system. Um, again, two coats over our, you can over our screed as well if you wanted to. Um, so the ultra top, uh, you've got two different ones. You've got an ultra top industrial, which is a wearing screed, which we uh, did at Bank Station, uh, the same project that Steve mentioned. That was uh, seven and a half thousand meters back of house. And that is a wearing screed um, that can be trafficked quite quickly. Just some case study. So this was at Bond Street Crossrail Station. Um, it was for Costain. Um, it's 220 metres of wall tiles back of house and 4,900 metres of trato tiles in all areas, um, giving you step free from street to platform. Um, the next one is Birmingham New Street Station for Mace. This was 20,000 metres uh, of our screed, tile adhesive and grout. And there's uh, the Ultrasoft Industrial to the concourse, which again is a wearing screed. This was quite a good product and uh, job for us. It's a render specifically designed to go over non-porous surfaces. So you can render over tile or glass. Um, it's sandwiched, it's a six mil system uh, with a mesh reinforced in the middle. Um, and it's, it, it saves removing the background basically. So if it's a tiled old station with tiles on it and you need it, just to make it nice, you can render over the top and then use a mineral-based paint over the top, um, which is exactly what we did here. Um, Victoria Street Station, this one was quite poor. So the end gable elevation to the building was found to be weak, friable and unsafe. Structural connections between the flank walls were improved, followed by application of a breathable structural render. And this Render is our Mappy Antique range, which is a lime base uh, materials for historic buildings um, used a lot across um, Europe. And that was the picture on the left um, is what it was. And this is the state of the building. And then this is the end result where it was all reinforced with carbon fibre um, Mappy Net and then re-rendered secured against the building. Um, another one was Gatwick Airport. Um, this was about 8,000 metres. You've got the tiles. It was all rapid drying screed. Again, time was of essence here. Um, they needed to get back on it very quickly. So we used our rapid drying screed and tile adhesives. And that was done for Belfort BT. That was probably about six years ago. And that actually won an award within MAPE around the world. Um, uh, nice project reference. So, yeah, that was a good good project for us. Um, Woolwich Arsenal Crossrail Station. Again, exactly the same products. Top chain was screeded. Uh, rapid tile adhesive over the top. Uh, fixed with the, I think that's a Aglo Granato Sem tile, um, which most stations are. And DMC contracts tiled that. Uh, okay. Abbeywood Crossrail Station. Same thing. Top chain. Tile adhesive, etc., and that's me done. Sorry, it was so quickly, um, but yeah, that's a quick you, brief. Thanks a lot, Zane. Thank you, Steve. Um, we've got a question here from Jane saying, with these systems being spray applied, is there room for innovation for application without a physical person to install it? Which kind of links in with the question I wanted to ask Steve, which is basically, given the fact that high performance materials are um, 
uh, our high performance materials generally, you know, doing doing big things like waterproofing tend to be fairly noxious. That one seems to be um, reasonably, I wouldn't say benign, but it certainly seems to be one of the less less noxious examples I've seen when you're kind of doing underground waterworks. Um, are any of these products possible to use in domestic environments? What if I wanted to do my basement? Can I use that? I'm, I'm, hi. Um, you can use something very similar. If, if I just go back to uh, the, the first couple of questions, the subject of um, robotic or automated application, one of the largest projects that's been done worldwide with the spray system, the Maplastic TU system, uh, is the Brisbane Metro um, in Australia, um, where I believe it was something like... Uh, 200,000 square meters, um, a huge, huge project. Uh, and in fact, my understanding is that that was robotically applied rather than uh, manually applied. So, so the answer is yes, these project, products do lend themselves to automated application uh, because they can sit in the lines and in the pump indefinitely. Uh, there's no uh, reactive component that uh, gives it a, an effective shelf life in the equipment. Um, and then it's a little bit like uh, spraying um, anything that you're going to spray. It's a case of software and the equipment being able to carry out what's needed. So in a tunnel environment, yes, I believe it's already been done um, on that particular project. In How about my basement? Okay, in terms of basement construction, if it's a traditional basement that is um, uh, a, a primary layer and a secondary layer, say shotcrete or something, then absolutely this can be this can be applied in that sort of situation, um, mm -hmm. and it has the advantage that um, it's not a um, uh, isocyanate reactive product like um, uh, metacrylates or um, polyureas, uh, so it's completely uh, not noxious um it's it's inert in that respect it's water-based so yes it can be done like that um when you come to something that's a little bit more domestic um there is a similar style of product but it's a slightly different formulation um and this is for um wet room environments and that sort of thing that map a market and it's called aqua defense in uh, seven kilo and 15 kilo tubs so for the more sort of domestic side of the business um, there's a very similar looking product that is, again, water based that is used in that environment. Uh, for basements, yes, you could use this, but you have to have a it's a sandwich system. It's got to be fully loaded with uh, both sides. Um, if it's not a sandwich system, then we have another system that could be used called map elastic foundation. Um, but that is a uh, it's a little bit like the traditional one I showed at the beginning. It's a cement polymer and a liquid. So you do come back to the manual handling aspects and, and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steve and Zane. Sorry to rush you, but I just know that our last speaker has to uh, get off. We need to give her, a, her her 15 minutes of time. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Interesting. Lovely to look at some of those infrastructure projects. Love seeing infrastructure projects when they're kind of half done. I love the whole idea of kind of like subterranean tunnels. There's fantastic shots there. Um, our final presenter will be Caroline Mills, uh, Associate Principal at Populous, uh, who joined Populous in 2000, has got a, built up a large portfolio of large-scale stadiums and arena projects, including the Emirates and Wembley Stadium, the O2 and uh, Dublin First Direct Arena in Leeds, Science Sports Centre, City, Sports City Stadium in the UAE. She'll be talking to us about the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, working on the design and surrounding master plan for the Northumberland Development Project from initial stages to completion. She was responsible for developing the brief, internal layouts, designing interior spaces and managing internal packages for procurement. Um, she was also responsible for reviewing relevant statutory and sporting guidance to ensure compliance. Uh, not being a great football fan myself, I'm yet to experience the famous roar that everybody has been banging on about uh, at the 62,000 seat stadium. Uh, but I'm intrigued to see how it was technically generated. So Caroline, if you're there. Yes, I am here. I will start sharing content. Hello. Go. There we go. Um, so um, I've been with Populous for 
21 years now. Um, and I have to say, at least for the purposes of impartiality, I have worked on both North London clubs. So I should be able to keep everyone happy. What? Our client, Tottenham Hotspur, in the form of Daniel Levy, set us a rather tall order with the design brief. Um, they had high aspirations um, and aims, which was a stadium that sets a new standard in design, fan experience, player experience and sponsor experience. A building which will ultimately be measured and remembered along the iconic architecture in Europe. And we hope we've delivered. White Hart Lane um, is at the heart of Tottenham. Um, the club were at the heart of Tottenham. And this is a, sh a shot of it in 2013. Unfortunately, um, Tottenham were faced with the riots of 2011, which showed how important infrastructure projects can be to regenerating neighbourhoods that really needed it. Um, and, you know, Tottenham was one of those neighbourhoods. So the site back in 2013 grew very quickly to 2015. Here we have a situation where the north of the site has been developed already into what's called Lily White House. This forms the club's headquarters, um, a Sainsbury superstore, and it ended up being used as a local sixth form college as well. The horseshoe of the stadium's slowly emerging just north of the existing White Hart Lane, and it showed the complexity of trying to build a new stadium on the site of an existing one and trying to keep the existing one running at the same time. In 2017, you see the horseshoe of the stadium really coming up around the existing stadium. Um, at this point, we were you know, just juggling fans in and out of the White Hart Lane while trying to keep a fully operational site running six days a week. Slowly but surely going through the slides. March 2019 sees the stadium itself practically complete. It opened in April. And maybe in 10 years' time, the stadium will look something like this. With um, In the background, you see Lily White House, the stadium in the middle. And there's a future development of residential and commercial uses proposed for the southern area. So in, in total, it's a huge mega block of a you know, small part of a city. So the master plan itself sees Tottenham sat quite strongly in the middle of the in the middle of Tottenham. There's a new proposed station connections, which were really important, trying to get 62,000 fans in and out as you know efficiently as possible um, was quite important. And you can see here the value of public space becoming important to the scheme. Also, being on a high road, um, unusually Tottenham is really in a dense urban area um, and actually onto a main high street. And this is a, the only time we've ever designed a stadium in this sort of context with the historic Georgian buildings to the North Terrace. Um, it, was, it was very important for us to engage with the street. Um, the street itself is a historic street that leads back into London, uh, connects Tottenham and to Cambridge and then back into the city of London. So it's historically quite an important strategic location. 
So part of what the project was about was the fan experience. Um, Tottenham fans being quite noisy demanded quite a quite an experience. A lot of it revolves around pubs. But unusually also we've installed a microbrewery within the stadium, which is fully functioning Beaver Town with its own special Tottenham Hotspur lager. The fan experience runs to the traditional luxury dining. And to the more modern penthouse experience, this is the Sky Lounge overlooking the, the pitch from the top of the west here. The stadium is intended to be multi-use as well. We um, provided spaces that were flexible um, and useful on non-match days. So this is one of the column-free com flexible conference spaces. Really doesn't want to move today. Um, and even challenging the idea of what border space can be, the press conference room can actually be used as a luxury cinema, um, accessible from the outside and, and used on non-match day. Obviously, there are areas that are only single use, um, the home team dressing room being one of them. So the transformation, um, Daniel Levy set us a challenge of the idea of transforming the stadium and making it more useful and became very interested in engaging with the NFL um, to bring American football to London. So here we were proposing the idea of a football pitch that could become an American football pitch. The multi-use stadium is, uh, is par partially enabled by this idea of a sliding pitch. It divides into sections and slides back into its own little parking garage um, underneath the south tier. So the, the grass pitch on top slides back to reveal the AstroTurf underneath. This is the grass in its um, little home underneath the south tier. This is the grow lights. We found that actually the, the pink light seems to make the grass grow better. So we have a virtual disco underneath um, the south stand when the grass is in there. And that enables NFL to be played within a very short space of time of a football match. The turnaround can be 48 hours between matches. Multi-use boxing also is, um, is an option as are concerts and other, other events. So the stadium is seen as not just being um, a football or a sporting venue, it's also a destination. The idea that we could provide a development around the stadium that embedded it within the local neighbourhood. There's a lot about placemaking. Um, the public space to the south of the stadium is the same size as Trafalgar Square. So it, it provides the space for plenty of fans to gather pre-match. Um, but it's also, it ends up becoming a place for people to be able to go on non-match day. So here you see the Southern development in its final configuration with residential blocks, um, sporting, sporting and entertainment and a hotel. Placemaking the street, um, 
to the southern end, we carved out a Tottenham shop, a museum, retaining a grade two listed building within the design. So it's partially history, partially future. We also provided a bit of adventure just recently opened is the rooftop walk where you can walk up the side of the building um, out over the pitch. Um, the cockerel and the ball is directly over the southern goal. Um, have your photograph taken and then abseil off the, the side back down to ground. Refuses to move. Apologies. Here we go. Um, just recently, I think what's happened in in all our lives is we've been challenged to think: what do we do in lockdown, and how do we deal with COVID? But it also challenged Tottenham to think: what is a stadium? And what was amazing was how um, how used it was during the last period where football couldn't be played. Um, it became the NHS Middlesex Hospital Maternity Outpatients Unit. Um, it was used for COVID testing and it was also used as a vaccination centre. This is actually just the concourse. Great spaces, let's use them much more. But ultimately, you know, to bring it back to everything, it is for fans, it's for football, it's for a sense of place. You know, this is a stadium that is in the heart of a neighbourhood, but it's for the fans. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the kind of whistle stop tour and um, Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. Um, there's just a few comments come through from people saying, uh, Simon Khan saying it's heartening to see a stadium that addresses its surroundings, although he also says, he's kind of asking how much was really thought about the idea of how, how effectively one can integrate a grade, a grade two listed building into the actual, um, into the final kind of built solution. Um, and also from Jane, who was saying flexi spaces are really vital, so it's a really great use of space. Um, my question is really, how do you create this famous roar that everybody's been talking about? And uh, secondly, I was kind of interested because I went to visit Populous, uh, um, it was the Stade de Lyon. Um, I uh, uh, wrote about that. And um, there was a discussion then, I remember, about the idea that there's slightly different rules, regulations governing how the French look at, at um, um, evacuating people out of, out of a stadium and how the British do it. And Brit with Britain, it's, with the UK, it's time-based. And with France, it's actually about um, uh, width of uh, uh, stair widths. So all of that has to do with how you design vomitoria and how effectively you kind of can create the, um, the angle of the the angle of the stadium itself, if you get my of how of how much it goes up, which I'm sure must be somehow linked to the first question about um, the roar. Um, can you offer any insight? Well, to, start, to start with the roar, um, when we were engaged to start looking at the design, um, atmosphere was a kind of priority with the client. And we looked very closely at how we've maybe done things in the past um, and how we could do things better in the future. One of the principal ideas was to try and get 17,000 people into one stand with no interruptions, breaks, or, or hospitality people who are a little bit quieter so that we could get a core group of home fans creating that noise. And then the second thing is to use the acoustics. So we worked with Vanguardia um, to amplify those natural acoustics that you get from the reverberation from the roof. 
so that we can get that that noise and capture it and harness it for the fans. So that's really about the the noise piece. In terms of um, engaging people and getting people out of the building quickly, which obviously at the moment I'm having to deal with the French system because I'm working on a project in France. So I, I've kind of gone through both um, both types. They are they are similar because it's about time, space, and a movement. So it's it's just the the, the the way the numbers are created make it a different um, different way of showing it. So in, in France, yes, they say, well, you have to have this amount of width for this many people in the building. Whereas in the UK, we say, okay, you've got to have this amount of width for this amount of people over this period in time to allow them to get out. So I suppose the, the net effect is very similar. Um, but it does mean that the staircases in France are a lot bigger than in the UK. We also work with um, crowd movement specialists who will do quite detailed um, mapping of, of crowd movement to really test out things in a way that I haven't seen done in France yet. Um, so they'll do computer modelling to show us where we've got our blockages and where we're getting good flow. Um, and that's really helped to inform the design as well, because people don't necessarily move the way you think they're going to move. Hmm. I mean, I th it's interesting that I am. Um, I, I really like the idea that you said you kind of devoted, you know, the raw is really about concentrating people in one particular stand in order to kind of like generate it. And I, I quite like that cognizance, really, that actually the, the kind of the gradual creeping corporatization of these spaces can actually lead to less of a of a of a visceral experience, I suppose, for your for an average person in the stand. But I think that idea of being aware of it and actually creating the architecture around it in order to facilitate something which is what would be embedded in the memory of anybody who's in the old stadium, one thinks, is actually quite a no, nice way of of approaching it as architects, I think. Yeah. No, nothing. Um well, I'm just aware now that I appear, uh, you're apparently having to like disappear off in the next two minutes in order to get to another meeting. So I'd just like to thank you very much indeed, Caroline, for that presentation, which I think gave us all a really nice idea, uh, really nice insight into the big issues around the design of it, and particularly some of the amazing shots, which I've not seen before, of the actual construction of the new stage, st stadium while the old one was there. It was almost watching a parasite take over a host body in a way. Very, very curious. I'd never seen those shots before, so those are amazing. Thank you very much indeed for showing okay. to us. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing them. Thank you. And I, I suppose I just need to round up now. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, architect speakers and indeed sponsor speakers for uh, making themselves available today uh, for me and for you. Um, uh, we're only 20 minutes over today, which is, uh, uh, amazes me because it was 45 before then. So I seem to be doing something right along here. Hopefully by the time we do our next one on one-off house design, I might actually be uh, completely on time, which would be amazing. Um, it just leaves me to thank um, everybody once again. Uh, thank you at home or in the office for uh, watching our presentation. And the next one next month, I believe, is on one-off house design, which should be a real goodie. Um, so I think it's about time, 11.33, 20 minutes late. You can all pop off for a cup of tea before lunch. Uh, thank you very much indeed for watching this webinar and we'll speak to you next month.